Thank you very much, Victor, and uh, welcome to the first panel of this conference. Um, may I introduce our panel just briefly? You will find a CV in the program also on the last page, but I would like to introduce uh, the member of this panel. It's uh, starting from the far right side, from the right side. It's Maria Kana. She's from Greece. She's a Supreme Court judge since 2006 before. She worked also as a attorney, so you saw both sides. <laughs> and currently she's a judge at the Greek Council of State and she represents the Supreme Judicial Council for Administrative Churches in the European Network of Councils of the Judiciary, ENCJ. We'll talk about this later. And she's there in the working group on independence, accountability and the quality of the judiciary. And next to her, we have Wolfgang Lemmer from Germany. He's honorary president of the European Union of Rechtspfleger. He worked as a Rechtspfleger in Germany on different tasks and he's been the president of the federal organization of the Bund Deutscher Rechtspfleger 2010 to 2016. And he's also been chairman of the main staff council at the Ministry of Justice of North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. And sitting to my right, please welcome Nicola Canestrini from Italy. He is a criminal defense lawyer with extensive in court experience dealing with human rights defense and international criminal cooperation cases. He's also qualified to practice before international criminal court. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a journalist on this panel, which should have been, but uh, uh, unfortunately she was invited but could not come. So I invite all the representatives of the media in the audience and maybe online to participate in our discussion later on. So without further ado, we start with Maria. Maria, you are here also to, re you represent judges, the judiciary, and also the European network of the councils of the judiciary. So maybe not everybody in the room or in the audience knows what ENCJ is. So maybe you can just briefly explain what it is. And uh, I know that uh, ENCJ had uh, carried out a number of projects dealing with our topics, so maybe you can tell something about this. Thank you, Sabine. First of all, I, I would like to thank Era and uh, Jean-Philippe and Victor for the invitation to participate in this discussion on a topic that is very important to the judiciaries around Europe. I'm here to convey the view of the judges and more specifically the view of the members of the European Network of Councils for the Judiciary, the ENCJ. The ENCJ has been, uh, was established in 2004 with the aim to bring together the national institutions in the member states of the European Union which are independent of the executive and the legislature and which are responsible for the support of the judiciaries in the independent delivery of justice. It currently has 21 members and 19 observers. From the first years of uh, its creation, the network has been intensely concerned with the issue of relations between the judiciary and the press. In 2011, it set up a project which aimed to study the best practices in how the judiciary could be better engaged with society and how the media could be used to achieve this goal. The project team came up with a wide range of best practices and drafted a set of recommendations. The topic has been a recurring theme in various projects ever since. I mention, apart from the Justice Society and the Media uh, report, the Public Confidence and the Image of Justice of 2018, and the individual and institutional use of social media within the judiciary that was uh, that ended up in a report in 2019. And finally, the judges survey that was conducted last year in 2022, uh, where relevant questions have been answered. But before getting into too much detail on the re recommendations and uh, maybe the discussion after that, um, please allow me some preliminary remarks. As we have been taught in the first years of law school, primary purpose of justice is to achieve social peace. And confidence in the judiciary and the functioning of the judicial system is therefore key to this end. 
But how do we build confidence? Some decades ago, judges would answer this question in a monosemantic way by deciding cases in an unbiased and well-reasoned way. But this approach has long been abandoned. As the keynote speaker, <coughs> speaker Judith Bayer mentioned, we are well aware that trust in the judiciary is not built by just adding up personal experiences of the users, but is primarily a matter of public perception and as such susceptible to being shaped by exogenous factors. The media is one of these factors. Actually, in most countries, media is the main source of judicial information. In the words of the Belgian Judicial Council that was posted uh, earlier on, the link on LinkedIn, communication is the bridge between the judiciary and society. There is, however, a delicate balance to be respected, the one between public interest and the right to information and the rights of the persons concerned by court proceedings, for example, the presumption of innocence. In the previously mentioned report, the project group, after working for it for almost a year, came up with the following key recommendations. First of all, all countries should develop and use a system of judicial spokesperson in the form of press judges and communication advisors who should have a deep knowledge about the judicial system, how to inform the public in an understandable language, and who has social and media skills. Second, audio and video recording could be allowed <coughs> into the courtrooms as long as there are special measures <coughs> taken to protect non-professionals from being filmed, and, but as long as there is a control system from the judge to stop filming whenever is necessary. Social media could be useful for the courts or the judicial bodies in their communication. It is recommended to develop a strategy, including target groups and goals for the use of each social media outlet. The reason for that is to have unmediated information so that the judicial information arrives unaltered to the public. The judiciary in each country should have a website under the responsibility of the Council of the Judiciary or the, judicial, uh, the court's administration. Every court should have its own site on the website of the judiciary. And these websites should contain information for the professional, the press, and the general public, and should contain a database of judgments which is freely accessible to the public. Fifth. There is a need for regulation of the relations between the judiciary and the media. Introducing a set of press guidelines, whether they are implemented by law or non-legally binding, <coughs> like a protocol or something, is recommended. They can never <coughs> interfere with existing legal limitations, of course. The press guidelines should be a part of a national strategy plan. Press guidelines should clarify Press guidelines should clarify the different goals and interests of both the judiciary and the media. It should state what the media may expect of the staff of the courts and how the courts should deal with the needs of the media before, during and after the trial. All countries are, finally, all countries are encouraged to develop a proactive media approach this approach should be focused on individual court cases as well as the entire judicial system. So these were the recommendations of 2012. So since then, it's 10 years ago. <laughs> so let's talk about today. <coughs> what uh, is the situation today? Well, um, the general idea is that uh, those recommendations have been largely followed by the judiciaries across Europe. So most judiciaries have spokespersons. Their training is another issue. In many countries, 
mostly Northern European and new EU members, there is a special communication strategy for the judiciary in place, and in some of them also press protocols. In almost all of the ENCJ members and observers, the courts have websites where anonymized judgments are accessible free of charge, and they use social media as a form of institutional communication. In very few countries is audio and media recording in the courtroom allowed, and there is a general trend towards a proactive media approach, but the degree varies among the members and observers. Some are more proactive, some are less. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we will come back to you later because recently you made a survey and that's also very interesting to us. But uh, now uh, maybe move on to another judicial profession, uh, Mr. Lemmer representing the Rechtspfleger. Um, I would like to ask you, you know, we are always talking about the judiciary and, and w when you talk about media, what do you think is the main focus of the media interest? Is it uh, including all of our judicial professions uh, or uh, is there a focus on just a few of us? Uh, what is your experience coming from the non-judges profession? Yes, uh, good morning everybody. Um, some have scripts, uh, some have uh, less uh, worked out scripts, and I don't have a script, so I will uh, try to speak freely. Uh, I'm uh, somehow like a paradise bird uh, of the justice system because <laughs> nobody knows what a Rechtsleger is. Um, and uh, usually I have to explain it uh, all the time, but uh, I will first uh, try to answer the question. Um, yeah, the problem that I see is um, uh, the, the lack of trust and the lack of uh, um, respecting uh, the judicial systems. Um, that also comes from the point that uh, all the media, or let's say the public um, imagination of a court is uh, based on just judges or prosecutors and nobody else in the court has anything to say. And that's not true. Judges or prosecutors wouldn't be able to work if there wouldn't be any court stuff uh, to support them. And there are different ways to support judges uh, in courts, uh, by court stuff. And for me, it's always a problem to say the word court stuff because court stuff is not what I represent. Um, we always say we are uh, more like special judges than court stuff uh, because Rechtsleger in Germany, especially in Germany, um, have a, an, a different tradition. And uh, that means uh, we developed from uh, a supporter of the judge to um, uh, an own responsible uh, court uh, institute. And uh, I would say... Uh, this is the difference in, uh, in, uh, in the systems uh, all over Europe because in most other countries, except Austria, of course, because they have the same uh, system as we, almost the same system as uh, we have in Germany, uh, in most other countries there are uh, more interests in supporting judges by assisting them, by preparing things for them so they can finally make decisions. But uh, we in uh, Germany found that it is much more effective if we just take away some tasks of the judges and put them into other hands that are also competent because we studied the law as well. So uh, uh, it's not we are amateurs. Um, and uh, this is the point that I think uh, is not very popular because the media of course doesn't really know what uh, a Rechtsleger is or what these tasks are for. And uh, that means um, we are not really recognized. Even if we are leading a case, uh, for, in for instance, a foreclosure of, uh, uh, of uh, real estates, um, then we sit uh, on, on the in, in, the in the courtroom, uh, on the uh, judge's desk, and uh, everybody asks, if they are especially young Rechtsleger, Everybody asks, uh, where's your boss? Can I talk to your boss? 
And uh, that's a problem because uh, it's a lack of respect and uh, a lack of understatement uh, for the people uh, to know that these decisions are final. They are as well final as the judges' decisions are final. And uh, that has to be learned. And so I would love to be more present. And that's uh, a thing we, um, we have to work on. And uh, then I come to the point where social media comes in uh, because the, the regular media is a little bit um, uh, reserved uh, against um, talking about us. Even there are some, uh, some small uh, things we already have. We have sometimes, we have an interest uh, in uh, a, a documentation about the work uh, that uh, we do and uh, we had some TV shows about that, but uh, it was uh, not the big ones that we have in, uh, for instance, uh, the, the court shows that we know uh, all over the TV. I think this, this is one of the points uh, that is m uh, m much more interesting for the, uh, the wider public, uh, because the wider public is watching TV shows in the afternoon or early evening, uh, which is entertainment. And uh, in these shows, no Rechtsleger uh, will ever appear. Um, we always laugh about uh, the, the thing that uh, the, the reading of a will is always made by a notary. But that's not true. It's the work of a Rechtsleger in Germany. We are reading the will. And uh, so th this is something uh, we have to work on. Mm -hmm. So to sum it up, um it might not only be a problem to have a bad image, it might also be a problem to have no image at all. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, we heard from, from Maria there are a lot of uh, strategies for communication uh, for, for your profession or, or related professions. Uh, uh, do you said you're using social media to, so to, to get in contact with the public. Yeah, but do you also actively work uh, or try to get uh, contact with journalists, with classic media? Uh, we try to. Uh, of course, uh, we, in our organization, uh, association, uh, we always try to have a, 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 a good contact to the, uh, I would say, regular media. And um, sometimes it works, but mostly there's no, um, no action in it. We, we, we don't have uh, a lot of scandals or a lot of uh, murder and crime, uh, so... <laughs> Nobody is really interested <laughs> if there isn't a bomb or something like that. <laughs> okay, so um, Nicola, we, we just heard there is a lot of interest in the courts, in the judges, in the prosecutors, so that's shaping the image of the judiciary, but I would narrow it down that the focus on media attention is on criminal cases, so you're criminal defense lawyers, and I, I'm a civil law judge, so we always have the impression this is the criminal cases are shaping our image to a largest extent, which we don't like, I have to admit. <laughs> so um, uh, what, is your, uh, wor what is your point of view? Uh, can, can, do you also see it that way? Good morning, first of all, and thanks for inviting me. It's a super interesting topic, and I would like to thank IRA and CCBA for um, giving me the chance without any merits to speak on this topic. Here, two caveats on this topic, which is uh, the idea is um, how can we deal with the mistrust in justice and in criminal justice especially? Because this mistrust is in affecting uh, our democracies. The first caveat is uh, we have to take great care because we are speaking about two fundamental rights, the most fundamental rights in democracies and rule of law, which is on the one side free speech and the other side the fair trial rights, namely presumption of innocence. The second caveat I would like to make is that we are speaking about key figures in our democracies, which are judges, which are journalists, which are lawyers. And it's not, um, it's not by chance that the undemocratic governments target those um, uh, professions uh, when it comes to um, realize their politics. Let's, let's think about Turkey, where uh, lawyers have been arrested out of the courtrooms in 2014, so two years uh, before the, coup the attempted coup d'etat, 
then they uh, continued in targeting journalists and judges as we learned. And I'm proud to say that we as defense attorneys in Europe, we organized um, trial observation groups uh, in those trials against lawyers, journalists and judges as well in Turkey and not only in Turkey. And then I have to admit as a criminal defense attorney, I'm going to be a little bit blasphemous, irreverent, I'm not an easy speaker <laughs> and maybe a little rogue, take it as my personal opinion. Uh, common grounds here is uh, that justice has to be a glass house because only um, um, tyrannies uh, administer, administer justice in secret. So justice administration has to be transparent. There's the right the public to be informed, let's put it like that. And of course, as the brilliant keynote speaker pointed out already, even the watcher have to be watched. The watchdog of democracies, they watch each other, first of all. So there is nothing wrong in critics, as I may address later on. But my problem as criminal defense attorney is that um, uh, as the um, European Court of um, Human Rights stated in 2010 in the Kutzmin case, a virulent press campaign can affect the fairness of the trial by um, uh, uh, affecting the presumption of innocence and making the defendant um, appear as guilty before the court has ruled about it. And um, we, we know the issue is a common known issue. We know the um, effort of institutions and our legislators, even with the EU on EU level with the Directive 343 of 2016 to protect this, protect this uh, presumption of innocence. Um, on the one side, journalists, they had to respect the presumption of innocence as well. There were Stras important Strasbourg rulings here um, that uh, recalled that principle, but with the media, with the social media, all this, um, um, the, the, the fact that the we and the courts try to recall important principles and to bound journalists to their ethics, this doesn't work anymore. What can we do then? Because this trial by media, as we call it, is affecting democracies and societies. And the, guilt and the guiltiness here is assessed in the early stages of the criminal investigation. Usually, when the guy and the defendant uh, is arrested, and there is the perp walk, and we had cases, I'm Italian, and the fact that the investigators, they um, make press conferences, leaking material to the public in order to build their case, is a problem in a later stage as well. Because first of all, people, they would like to have vendetta. They don't want justice. Nobody's interested in justice when it comes to criminal cases. We immediately focus on the victim's perspective. We immediately identify criminal defense attorneys with the defendant. We do defend, we defend crimes in the idea of the public. We don't defend rights. And the second thing is when the public is used to hear how guilty the defendant is in the investigation phase, when he or she got acquitted, of course the mistrust is against the courts. Because how can this guy be acquitted? If the blood was found, if the telephone conversation, the leaked telephone conversation uh, were in the media. So the problem of the mistrust of justice is of course uh, very, um, is bound to the um, narrative that investigators give in the very early stage. So um, probably I would start there, even if there are cases <laughs> in which the criminal defense attorneys um, attack the judiciary, uh, questioning the legitimacy of their rulings, but we may speak in a couple of minutes about that. Okay. <coughs> so just, just one more question, because uh, we talked about transparency and uh, media, or press now, Okay. and press releases and, and, and um, you already mentioned it but there is a conflict of interest obviously because uh, 
we say the courts or also the public prosecutors, they should communicate with the public, with the media, but on the other side, this could interfere with the rights of the accused with a fair trial assumption of innocence. So there is a, a thin line, obviously. Yes, the line is very thin, but the fact that um, a task is difficult should not prevent us to try to solve it. And I'm definitely in favor of a public official information. Judges and judiciary has to be trained as <laughs> criminal defense attorneys because um, it's often um, very ridiculous when criminal defense attorneys are questioned by journalists and they start to speak Latin. <laughs> <laughs> which is not very effective, I would say. I don't have anything against Latin <laughs> about our quotes, but <laughs> it's ineffective, so we have to learn to communicate, and judges need to learn to communicate. Uh, it's a complex task. Justice is not black and white. It's a scale of gray, of course, and people don't like scale of grays, <laughs> generally, uh, but um, it shouldn't prevent us to try to do so, and if there is no official information, Italian Supreme Court started to make press releases the Italian Constitutional Court, the Italian Supreme Court, in um, very well-known cases in the public opinion. And this definitely goes, I think, in the right direction, because if I need reliable information, where should I go? There is no <laughs> distinction anymore between uh, serious uh, information content, like newspaper established uh, um, voices in the information landscape, and somebody, a small criminal defense attorney from Rovereto, which is not Caput Mundi, uh, uh, speaking about uh, Latin quotes. So you, it's, it's very difficult to understand where the official information comes from. And if there is no s official source, it is impossible to understand for general public which uh, source is uh, more, most reliable if it's the New York Times or Nicola Canestrini tweet, tweeting or on X something, saying something. So um, judges, from my experience, um, the complexity of the tasks uh, which uh, are handled by criminal justice especially makes it very difficult to effectively communicate. Journalists, they like quotes, they like a little bit uh, um, very short sentences, it, that's not always easy. And here it comes to the problem of clickbaiting, because journalists, um, if journalists are paid by how many clicks they have on their <coughs> articles, this affects professionalism, of, of course, because it's the headline is important, uh, the face of the defendant in tears, or the voice of the victims, which is an important part of our administration of justice, don't get me wrong, but justice cannot be to be um, uh, to to be a um, to speak for the victims because victims and justice victims right it's, it's not equal to justice so at least um, having a, a trained professional communicator in courts would help to address the right topics and I don't think that just as I think uh, that um, criminal def uh, criminal um, defense attorneys are always trained in communicate so often there is a lack of communica official communication and good communication by judges as well. So maybe um, higher professional journalists for that could be a good start. So that's a perfect bridge to come back to Maria and the role of the judges in communicating. You, as we already uh, talked before, you made a survey among uh, the judges or the, or the councils uh, about the current challenges, and especially what's interesting us is the interaction between the justice and the media. So maybe you can tell us about this. Yes, that's true. We did a, re uh, a survey recently because this uh, report was dated from 2012, so it's been a long time, and we r really needed to see how our members felt about the current situation. So unfortunately, judiciaries around Europe continue to face challenges vis-a-vis uh, -vis the press. And I need here to make a distinction between the countries where the press is free and the countries where the press is not free. So the main challenge in countries where the press is not free is political or other agenda of the press. And that leads to smear campaign against judges. We have already discussed this. Targeting individual judges and courts, leaks, and uh, deliberate misreporting. On the other hand, in countries where the press is free, 
challenges can be further distinguished in two categories. One, uh, challenges that are basically attributable to the media and challenges attributable to the judges. So the m one of the main challenges attributable to the media, as Nicola has already mentioned, is the what is called sensationalism or clickbait journalism. That means the presentation of stories in a way that is intended to provoke public interest or excitement at the expense of accuracy. Mm. That's a problem, but I'm a little bit, uh, I'm not very optimistic on that because it seems to be inherent in human nature to go for the most sensational news than the accurate one. So um, also, there is a lack of, un uh, on, on the part of the press, of the media, <laughs> there is a lack of understanding of legal processes. And uh, it has been pointed out by some of our members that uh, reporting has become superficial. It is observed that journalists are no longer specialized in judicial reporting and they cannot understand the processes, which has as an inevitable result unintentional misreporting, not the deliberate <coughs> one in countries where the press is not free, but uh, I don't know if that is because the journalists um, are under pressure, as Nicola said, to have more clickbait or click, uh, clicks on their news, um, or if they have a lot on their plates, but uh, that is something that has been pointed out by, by our members. <coughs> Concerning the challenges attributable to judges is the language of judgments, which is technical and sometimes too legal, and the judgments may be too large for a person with no legal background to read, uh, and the lack, some lack of proactivity on behalf of the courts, and also the fact that judges are reluctant to engage in communication with the press not properly trained, and they feel that there are high demands on them to cope with media pressure, and there is a fear of media exposure. Mm -hmm. So um, these are the, the basic challenges, but also I would like to stress some concerns that have been voiced by our members, and um, some of them have already been uh, mentioned. First of all, uh, there is this concern about live streaming and blogging of trials. There is a risk of becoming another form of entertainment, like a spectacle. This issue was already raised, uh, but I think it's an important one. Uh, clips from trials tend to be to become a new a new form of spectacle. Also. As Ms. Bayer has already up touched upon this subject, uh, who is entitled to privileged information? How do we define a journalist in the digital era? What is truly press and what is not nowadays? I think that deserves a conference on its own, but uh, that's something that was uh, already mentioned before and something that was raised by our members because Journalists have the right to information and uh, the administration of justice, as Nicola said, they have right to more information in order to be able to inform the public. But who is a journalist, really? And do, uh, do the courts have to disclose all in, uh, judicial information, sensitive judicial information, to people who present themselves as... <coughs> uh, journalists or TikTokers or bloggers. bloggers. And the last bit was also mentioned. Um, in our recent judges survey, there was a question about whether judges feel that they have um, undergone inappropriate pressure from media and if they feel that their independence is respected by the media. Unfortunately, in most judiciaries, judges feel that ha they, they feel inappropriate pressure from conventional and social media. Mm -hmm. 
to judge a case, what Nicola also mm -hmm. touched upon. And um, many of them feel that their independence is not respected by the press. And I think that's something that we, we also need to discuss. Mm -hmm. The feeling of the judges that uh, they are, in a way, attacked mm -hmm. by the media or the social media, mostly. Mm -hmm. so, so you worked at some best practices, I think, also on some, uh, at least on some of these <laughs> questions, not all of them. Of course, <laughs> there, are no, there are no perfect solutions. Uh, these are very complex issues. But if we could highlight some best practices, I think we could uh, maybe go towards two directions. One would be towards uh, responsible reporting, because accuracy, fairness, and balance is key to responsible reporting. Some best practices I, uh, include the adoption of legal and ethical frameworks in guiding media reporting on legal matters. In some <laughs> countries, there exist. Guidelines, and uh, my colleagues they they tell us that this is helpful. It helps to clear the mm -hmm. environment of the relations between the judiciary and the press, and also the respect of the rule of law and ensuring a fair trial process mm -hmm. being embedded in journalists' training. I think that's also very important. And the second direction is the collaboration between the judiciary and the media. Recruitment of media experts. Uh, as Nicola mentioned before, it's really important. In some, in some countries, it's, uh, it's a practice. Also, media-friendly versions of judgments in the form of press releases, but maybe a, a little bit longer sometimes. But the, the important thing is for cases that attract public interest, there should be a form, a, a version of the judgment that is easy to read and understand by a non-professional. Um, encouragement of institutional periodical communication, not personal relations between the judges and the journalists, that is, uh, that is clear, but uh, periodical communication in the form of breakfast meetings, that's something that is being done in some countries, and training for journalists on the functioning of the courts uh, would be, I think, uh, helpful towards uh, this um, collaboration between media and justice, because at the, at the end we all serve the same purpose, the public, so we... <coughs> At least that's what we should do. <laughs> so we should collaborate to this end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, Mr. Lemmer, may I come back to court stuff in general and the courts in general? Because um, we talked about the court trials, the sensations, the criminal trials and all uh, that comes with it, but um, I mean, there are not only challenges for the judges or the prosecutors, there are a lot of challenges for the courts themselves. I'm talking about digitalization, problems with human resources and budget. Um, do you think that the media is also addressing these problems of the judiciary in, in general? What is your, your impression and would it be important? Yes, of course it's not um, because uh, you can see that uh, the interest in uh, the judicial system behind the judges and uh, the prosecutors uh, is not very high um, because uh, you, you see uh, the budgets of, um, uh, of justice in all the countries is very low uh, from the general budget of a country. Uh, so there's always not enough money uh, to build up anything you want. Uh, we see that right now in the digitalization in, in countries like uh, Austria, it works very well because it's centralized and not very big. You, you have, maybe you don't have enough money, but you have uh, enough power to uh, organize things. In Germany, we have a different uh, situation. We have 16 countries uh, and a federal system and uh, everybody does his own thing. And uh, that means uh, there is never enough money, especially in uh, some parts uh, of Germany um, and um, that 
shows that we have to find uh, an, a different approach. Um, I, I would like to, um, to go on with uh, the, the topic, uh, how we can uh, build up uh, trust by using media and, uh, um, and press. And I think I would uh, even go a little further than uh, we were thinking right now. I would uh, like uh, that we not only publish uh, the decisions, make it uh, public, uh, but uh, also um, be our own press institute, own media institute. Uh, the, the courts, maybe not every court, but the high courts, for instance, uh, could get a task of uh, own journalism by uh, using um, uh, the, the social media and uh, therefore make reports and even reports in easy language uh, because we see it in, in for instance in the in the federal ministry of justice in germany uh, and in most of the other uh, ministries too uh, we see on the website always a part uh, of translating things into easy speech easy language and uh, that is in my opinion is the most important thing because um, in my career uh, as a Rechtspfleger, we always were known as the translator uh, to the people uh, for uh, what uh, the, uh, the, the judges said. They come to us and say, oh, what did he say? I say, okay, he meant this and that. Or if people come to the court for the first time, um, they go to a Rechtspfleger to ask what they can do with their case and we... Uh, uh, give advice and, and uh, tell them how to uh, start a court trial. And uh, th this is something we could build up because um, not only Rechtspfleger but also the other parts of the court stuff is able to translate what is meant by uh, the things that uh, happen in the courts. And uh, so this would be a good platform uh, to go into public and tell the people what it's all about. And I'm sure that people who can understand and read uh, what's uh, happening there will be more uh, interested uh, in, um, in, in court procedures uh, than now uh, that they only see the, uh, the, the scandals or the, the bad things that were up there. Um, I also made the experience that um, <coughs> I mean, it's very easy to blame the courts to work slowly and there are delays, but if you know that there is no staff, IT is not working <laughs> and other problems, uh, you might understand that there is a reason for it. Uh, it's not because the judges are lazy, uh, but uh, usually you, ha you have to get the interest of the media to get the interest of the public and uh, only then you get the interest of the government and get budget. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a circle. Um, so we need attention for these uh, matters at, as well. Um, we already um, addressed this, but I would like to go more deeply into it. Um, besides transparency that I think we all agree is necessary and of course justified criticism is also very valuable for us. Um, we all see a, a decline of democracy. There is less respect for rule of law, for institutions in general, for the separation of powers and the independence of the judiciary in many countries, also in Europe and within the European Union. So uh, do we have a, a common, as judicial professions and the media, a common responsibility to strengthen the trust in the judiciary and, and the work of the judicial professions in general, and, and um, I might start with Nicola, uh, with, with the role of the lawyers and their, their responsibility in this respect. And uh, I may take this uh, opportunity also to touch a little bit upon litigation PR, because this is also uh, shaping <laughs> uh, image of the judiciary sometimes in a not very nicely way. <laughs> Yes, we do share common responsibility in upholding the idea of justice, which is kind of a, a place where we would like to go. It's not something that we can say it's achieved. So we should at least, we have the right to hope. <laughs> um, everybody of us involved in what justice becomes. And yes, 
the lawyers. Uh, there was a case, Maurice against France uh, in 2015, I think, uh, uh, Strasbourg court, which said that uh, it was a defamation case in which Mr. Maurice, who was a colleague, a defense attorney, has been convicted for defamation because of his excessive criticism um, to what the court did. And in that ruling, Strasbourg court pointed out very clearly that um, lawyers have a special role in the administration of justice and upholding the idea of justice. And I do agree, because um, defense attorneys are part of justice system. Um, so how they communicate, it is important for justice, of course. But, uh, and their ethics, and I think this is um, a field where not laws are required, not punishments, not um, disciplinary actions, but strengthening ethics of everybody involved, starting from my category, which is um, defense attorneys one. Uh, the ethics of um, uh, lawyers, journalists, judges, they may raise the quality of um, the communication and so the idea that justice works against uh, the general idea of the public opinion. But in the moment in which everybody becomes a journalist, everybody is going to, to uh, communicate about justice, all these ethics, these standards that we are um, keen to develop don't have and don't have that much sense anymore, because if everybody is going to tweet something, to write something about wha what happened to his brother, friend, neighbor, whatever, and this is then um, spread uh, all over social media, only rely on ethics cannot work, and you will know what. Who cares about if somebody criticizes us? Who cares? Is this is the fear to be misjudged that important? As Angelika Nussberger, she was um, judged to the Strasbourg court till 2020, I think, pointed it out in a very interesting interview that you can find online. Richter werden kritisiert. The judges are born to be criticized. They cannot always please both sides if it's civil or criminal um, uh, cases. So who cares if general public is going to criticize the uh, courts? Who cares if, I don't say that that should be accepted, but I am saying that's not that important. Because if, it's, if, if I go uh, down to the public opinion, I'm a criminal. Because I do defend criminals, not rights as I stated before. And simply at, the one, at one moment, we have to say that's it. I have to live with that, that people, they don't like what I do. They hate me when I'm standing up for the rights of my clients. And so courts, they may do the same thing. Because justice is a battle, isn't it? And in battles, metaphorically, I have to add, because we are um, deeply affected by those battles that are really going on in the world. So please take my words with a little bit of patience here. But if, if justice is a battle, uh, the um, strong and, and excessive uh, um, expressions have to be tolerated. You may remember Texas against Johnson. It was the case uh, um, litigated before the U.S. Supreme Court in 1989. It was Mr. Johnson. He burned a flag, a U.S. flag. And the U.S. Supreme Court said the fact that we allow that is the strongest evidence of our um, of how um, strong our principles are. Of course, we do recognize the importance of free speech, and if my neighbor says that I'm criminal, I have to live with that. Power has to be criticized, and this applies to courts, not to the criminal defense attorneys. Courts represent power, and it is um, part of democracies that um, powers can be criticized and should be criticized. Of course, not always, um, not always, um, it is not always um, on, on shared grounds, and of course, if we stay <coughs> on the topic, on the matter, not on the person, this sh of course we do all agree that this is a kind of um, a line that we shouldn't allow to be um, uh, crossed here, 
um, even if it comes to criticisms from lawyers, even if I had to admit, in my 20, over 20 years career, I, ov I rarely defended powerful clients. Usually, what criminal defense attorneys do is they defend voiceless defendants. So um, I wouldn't shape it in the same way, okay, courts are tact, I, can, I come from Italy, and may Mr. Berlusconi can be an idea for everybody here in the courtroom, how he tried, and it's of course my opinion here, to influence and to target the courts that um, presumed uh, that were, there were um, criminal behaviors coming from him, but this is just one case. Usually courts, they deal with general, uh, the general public and the voiceless defendants. And here, again, why I'm, let's say, in a very um, irreverent manner, why I'm absolutely in favor of a heavy criticism to courts, and generally I don't think that this is affects the legitimacy uh, of justice. Because the presumption of innocence is a cornerstone of rule of law. If the presumption of innocence is questioned, in the public opinion, the presumption of innocence has to be de de defended in public opinion as well. And so when it comes to cases in which powerful or voiceless defendants are presented as guilty before it came to the definite decision of courts, yes, it is a right and it shall be a duty for the criminal defense attorney to stand up for the rights of the defendant and in doing so, defending the rights of everybody in challenging that conviction over the, over the media. Um, so I wouldn't be that affected by the critics coming from general public to courts. Um, it has been already pointed out, it's a complex issue, um, it's a scale of gray, um, the mechanisms are complex, it's difficult to communicate justice because um, you cannot give a, a clear statement on one uh, outcome or a justification why the decision came this way and not that way. And even if we had perf the perfect journalists, perfect communicator, and the perfect shape press statement and press release, the critics will commit. Uh, I think we have to live with that. So that was much uh, from the legal professions. Oh, no, now our journalist just left the room. <laughs> <laughs> but as I, as I said before, I would invite uh, any representatives of the media. You, I think Victor has some comments online for us uh, and invite uh, also other people to participate in a discus discussion. First, the room. Okay, so um, who's got a microphone and who would like to raise a question or make a comment on what's been said? So, do we have a microphone for Dorota? <laughs> Please introduce yourself. My name is Dorota Zabudowska. I'm a criminal judge and member of the board of the Polish Judges Association Justitia. And basically, I've been coping with what uh, Nicola was saying for about 20 years now, as I'm a criminal judge. And Commenting on what Maria said, we can complain, but we can't change the world. Clicks happen because everybody clicks, and that's a pact. So instead of complaining, I think that we should do our best to adjust to the situation. I mean, it's very important for the judges to communicate uh, their verdicts uh, in an understandable way. And I've coped many times with what Nicola said, that somebody gets acquitted and the public get angry because... Uh, because uh, this was such a horrible crime. And I think it's up to the court to explain why the person got acquitted, about the presumption of innocence, about the lack of evidence, and so on. So if we hide behind paragraphs, if we don't look the people in the eye, then we don't have the result of communication. And <laughs> one practical note is that uh, it's very useful after we uh, announce a verdict to ask the journalists if they have any questions. Because they are not professionals, uh, they don't know the law, and they are sometimes they are ashamed to ask. 
and, very, and they appreciate that very much when the court tries to explain it uh, even more than they have to. And on a more systemic, uh, on a more systemic level, I think the judges need mm, training in communication. And uh, I think there, is, uh, there could be an institution like that. We have this pr uh, in our projects for the new law to have a spokesperson for the judiciary. Because other branches, you can see that we are quite uh, helpless when confronted with uh, politicians that, that was in the previous lecture. Because they can say and write whatever they want and we don't have a voice at the, ju uh, the judiciary. <laughs> because it's not the council, it's not the presidents of the courts, it should be one person or a, a team of persons who communicate this, uh, the standing of the judiciary and that could help a lot in communication, I think. Thank you. Do you want to comment on this, Sandra, from the, from the panel? Yes, please, Mr. Lemmer. Yes, I think um, th this is a, a very important thing. You know, in Germany, we have those spokes, uh, uh, speakers of, uh, of the courts, uh, especially of the middle and high courts. Uh, when um, big cases are published, there's just one person allowed to speak to the public and to the press. And I think th that's uh, a good start, but um, most of those speakers are still judges and uh, still not able to do easy language. Um, so it, it is most important that uh, people are trained, that are trained in uh, these special tasks. And the other thing is, of course, uh, over the years, especially in my profession, you get a, a very thick skin about criticism. You, you are criticized all the time, and it, it's okay. Um, it's not the criticism that is a problem, it is the reaction and um, what, what it causes. And... Uh, I think the, the only way to get over uh, the, the lack of trust and the lack of uh, trust into um, uh, independence is to inform in a way that the people can understand. So for me, th the most important thing is to publish and to communicate um, everything that happens in a way that people, normal people, can understand and not only <laughs> jurists. So easy language and bite size. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to, co to comment on something that Dorota said about uh, training of spokespersons uh, and the, on behalf of the judiciary. Because systems are so different, in some systems you need to train the media experts in law, in in the way, the functioning of the courts, and they are the voice, and they have all the tools to deal with the media. And in other systems, you have to train judges to deal with the media. So um, I think it's important to, to do a training that would uh, take into account all best practices in uh, the European countries, because there are some cases where that works perfectly and uh, we could all, be all benefit from that. I know that uh, in Greece, uh, in the National School for Judges, there is a special subject on training on communication, judicial communication, but what happens with the judges that uh, are not in their initial stage of training, we need to, uh, to have some training for continue, uh, the some form of continuous training for judges or for spokespersons uh, in particular, and that would benefit from a larger project. I'm here referring to the EJTN that could be very helpful in the future to have a, a program um, where people from different countries could contribute to this training and era, of course. So I saw the microphone already moved. <laughs> Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrea Moravčíková and uh, I'm speaker in next panel coming from Supreme Court of Slovakia. Uh, actually, this, this is really uh, very inspirational and I, I hope in the next uh, panel I will you know, just uh, repeat some ideas. But what was not mentioned, and maybe uh, speaking uh, to Nicola, uh, what should we 
compare as position of judge uh, and bailiff or, uh, or lawyer generally, what is the first that as a judge I have in my head is I have to be restrained, modest, uh, moderate when I want to tell anything. And then it's different to be first instant judge, appellate court judge, or me as a Supreme Court judge, when I try to express something easy way. So it can be really dangerous. That's why it's so important to have educated journalists, not to try to attack us as we don't want to say or we don't want to explain something. So I will mention it in, in, in my presentation, what happened in Slovakia, maybe very shortly, would help the case and uh, which way it can somehow influence when the judge is open, not using spokespersons, but still it is the best way because they can keep communication neutral. Of course, if the judge is courageous enough to speak, he or she can, but it's not easy to speak in easy words, without emotions, because because being judges, we are part of process. We are perceived to be part of uh, the case for public. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's very important to be restrained. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I know we have others from, from the audience, but Victor just reminded me that our online participants also would like to take the floor and we have two of them. Please, Victor. So thank you very much to my panel and to the audience. Thank you.